My wife always told my kids there's always free cheese in the mouse trap. <laughs> I live at 28 Washington Street here in Concord, and uh, I have been trying to adjust what I was, what I want to say here tonight. Quite frankly, with this issue, I was totally asleep about it. I hardly knew what a bear cap. I didn't know what a bear cap was until a friend asked me, and and then I, I found out that it is. Uh, and when I read about it, when I read this article from the application, and was shocked to consider, to realize that the, bear, the justification for the Bearcat, um, part of it was, was the Occupy New Hampshire move. And all of a sudden, I woke up. Um, <clears throat> I, I wasn't deeply involved in that. I was marginally involved in it. Um, but to find that I was a threat, a public threat, a daily threat, uh, I was really shocked. And it's, it's more disconcerting because according to its website, the Occupy movement in New Hampshire no longer exists in an organized, functioning way. And so then this application is using a non-functioning organization to, to justify its application. Um, so for me then, the, if that's the case, when you're looking at the organization listed was never violent and presently is not functioning, then the current rationale for painting a bear cat is invalid from my perspective. Um, Let's see, if I'm going to use Will's time, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's Will's last name, so I can take his card out of the pocket. All right, keep on going. All right, I'll do one more paragraph here. Okay. Some of us are concerned about the militarization of our police force. One website contrasts the difference between the creeds of the military and the police. It states that the military... UNIT's mission is to deploy, engage, and then destroy the enemies of the United States of America in close combat. That's the soldier's creed. The police creed, as some other people have said here tonight, is to protect and to serve. And so our understanding is, is that the training for this Bearcat comes from the military. And so with training from the military, and, and the use of the Bearcat, we're concerned that it's an easy for the military creed of conduct to start overcoming the police creed of conduct. And that, that concern is heightened when we look at what the acronym for Bearcat stands for. The acronym stands for Ballistic Engineered Armored Response Counter Attack Truck. It was presented here tonight as a rescue truck. I hope that to get it, it's used that way. But it's designed to be a military attack vehicle to destroy the enemy. And, and so given that, since a number of us here have been designated the enemy, we have some concern about that. <laughs> I think that's why we're out of end. But I, I do appreciate your time. I do appreciate being able to be heard here. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Could I, I try? Do you mind if I just kind of try something a little different? But that was excellent testimony. Um, so based on based on what you're saying, and based on Carla, uh, what Carla was saying, there, there's a lot of concern. But the one of the basic concerns is the identification of the three parties related to in the application as being labeled domestic terrorists. That's part of it. There's other parts of it, because I think that there's cut two, really two perspectives. The city and the organization that wants to is trying to replace an existing vehicle. 
However, you don't want it to be used or identified to be used on three entities that are not domestic terrorists in any way, terrorists in any way. So Carla had an idea, which was, from, correct me if I'm wrong, she had an idea which was, well, what if the language related to the domestic terrorist piece and the labeling of those three organizations were re was removed from the application? And that application was resubmitted. And if it floated on its own, it floated on its own. If it didn't float on its own, then the feds could take the money and say, is that reasonably close to what you were, what you were saying? So that way no organization is identified. That way there's no stigma related to any organization, any of the people who belong to it or lived with it and whether they've been 25 years or not. So when I, talk, I talked to the Chief Duval about this after Carla had sent me several emails with some good ideas. And he sent a letter to the um, Department of Safety. And the Department of Safety, um, as in, with the recommendation that we remove all the references to the three parties and the labeling of domestic terrorists to any of those parties, and would they consider the application again and, and determine whether or not this, the funding would still be appropriate. So they did. And they sent us a letter that said, Yes, we'll accept your amendment to that application, removing reference to all those parties and the label of anybody as a domestic terrorist in any way. Um, so it'll be permanently stricken and this new amendment would be in the file. And based on the findings of the rest of the application standing on its own, you're still eligible for the grant. Does that sound like a reasonable accommodation that allows the city to move forward and the organization to move forward and replace a vehicle I haven't heard one person testify in terms of. Let, let me go. Saw from, one big I'm question. Just, I'm right? just doing this. Uh, <laughs> and I haven't heard one person testify that the city of Concord acts in any way other than using great community policing standards. So it's really the concern that things will change, and it'll be it'll happen differently. Yes, that was guys. Let's see that. So what? So does that sound like a reasonable? If the Department of Safety is saying, well. If you remove those, those, we don't believe those, that reference is important. It's not important to us. The city and the other organization, parts of the organization of pipers don't believe it's important to us. We don't believe it's, I'll, I'll definitively state, I don't believe any of those three groups of domestic terrorists. When I saw the application, I didn't read it that way, but I can see how other people could read it that way. That's what I'm recommending to the city council, and why not move it forward and replace that vehicle? Manchester has one. I didn't see an uproar in Manchester when Manchester went to buy one. They did it in secret. Yeah. So, so, so what does that teach? What does that teach government, right? Do it so, in secret. Yeah. So we don't do that. Here. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do that. Here. Right. So, and same thing with Nashua. I saw it in Kenya. It's probably the only place I've actually seen it. So, right, I want to stop and maybe take a read. Yeah. Actually, did you uh, come up here? You can go. Uh, being the chair, I can go out of order. Just because, really, it's. He was responding to your right. questions more than yours, Mr. Fitzgerald, if that's okay. Um, so really, those are questions responding right. to your right. input. And I don't mind sitting here for another five hours of public testimony, but I think if we can come to some sort of understanding that works for you and works for us. I mean, I think this is a step, and a great step in the right direction. It does address, obviously, some of our concerns as an organization. I think the two issues that would still concern me well, first of all, I would like to read it before I agree to anything. Um, but also, I think to the point of some of the people who testified here with regard to the question of integrity um, and the question of, is Chief Duvall, who wrote this grant, he admits to writing it, he has twice said he takes full responsibility for it. I think the question then becomes whether he is someone we want in public office getting this replacement vehicle. He, he is someone you want in public office. He truly believes in community policing. He works for me. And I'll make sure he's the guy who decided we're going to have bicycles going down the street. He's the guy who decided we're going to have people walking through the downtown. And if you talk to the people who frequent Eagle Square and Bicentennial Square, he'll be the one who tells you that those are the folks, the reason that those folks are down there now and meeting with the shop owners and talking to them is because it's cheap well, I respect well, you. Disagree. What I'm going to do at this point is uh, going to give you a minute to look at that. Uh, any questions for Mr. Fitzgerald? Could, could, could I could I respond to that? Yes, you can because you did ask a question. Go right ahead. 
Um, I don't know what went on behind the scenes in, in making this application and or what has happened here with you. But when I read when I read those three sentences, it's like it it seems like to me that there hasn't been the proper thought and consideration going into this application in the first place. And so it makes me very uneasy about it. It makes me feel like that some of these things that we're concerned about, about the cost, about the militarization, uh, are, have not been considered properly. And it makes me afraid that it's going to be creeping from, from, a, from a military code of conduct to uh, from a police code of conduct to a military code of conduct. It, it, it doesn't engender confidence. So that's... Thank you very much. Okay. Um, next up, uh, Seth Hippel. And uh, I just want to state for the record, normally the council would be taking a break at this point. I'm not going to take a break just so the testimony can continue. But I say that out loud just in case you do see some councils leaving the room just for a second or two. Don't be offended. We're just going to keep on going without a break. But if any of the councilors feel like they need to use the facilities for a second, go right ahead. Thank you, Mr. St. Clair, <coughs> members of the, the council. Um, my name is Seth Hippel. I live in Concord and 45 Concord Street. I'm also a small business owner. My business is in the uh, Round Pole Marketplace building. I put food on the table for four families here in Concord. I also was concerned uh, with the wording of, of the application, and it was interesting when I listened to Chief Deval on the exchange. He said, "Well, we're, we're not. We're, we're more concerned with people who uh, would infiltrate these groups, and uh, you know, and, and do terrorist activity." But that's not what the application said. <clears throat> the application actually said that they present daily challenges, and I want to know what happened last Wednesday, where Chief Deval needed a bearcat and didn't have one. I, I think that Mr. Spell's uh, comments were very helpful, and I, I hope that uh, if the council feels that this needs to be approved, that the application, not just to the Department of Safety, but also to the Department of Homeland Security, can be amended to clarify that uh, I don't think these statements are just false. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Oh, there's a question. Just a quick question. What, what business does your business say you operated downhill? Yes, um, it is the law offices of Martin Heppel is my law. Uh, Christine Bonser, maybe? Bonser, and Bonser? I yielded my time to Carla Garrico of the Free State Project. Okay. Well, somebody else did too, so I'll give you the opportunity because uh, somebody else already yielded, so I'm not going to take two people's time for that. Hello, everyone. Thank you for hearing our testimony on this really important issue for the area. A lot of people have already said a lot of the things that I wanted to say, um, but I just want to kind of point out that you know, I'm, a, I'm a Free State Project participant that signed the move um, to move to over 10 years ago with my husband because we're from Southern California, San Diego natives, um, and we wanted to come to a place that was where we did feel safe and where we weren't feeling like there's a policeman behind me, is he going to have unfounded suspicions or be bored and pull me over because he doesn't like the way my car looks. And we decided to leave California for that very reason, because we wanted to live near our neighbors and, and take part in our community. I'm a wife, a mom, and a business owner. My husband and I brought both of our businesses here. We brought our family, our businesses, our money, and our charity here. We want to share that with the community. We want to be a part here, and when we heard that we were named, again, as you've heard a lot, this is an issue, um, that we were named as, as domestic terrorists, it, it kind of shook us all to the core because we're very happy peace, people who want to help our neighbors. Um, I fear very much that having a ballistic engineered armored response counterattack truck in our backyard and the militarization of our peace officers will shift the attitude of police, city, and state officials to domination, rather than a peaceful interaction between parties, between neighbors. And a fraudulent claim on any grant request, let alone to the DHS for a Bearcat, would be met with severe punishment for anyone 
that doesn't have the cloak of the government to protect them. Ms. Belcher, that's what you know, say of your time. Um, Councilor Keijo, a question? Uh, point of order. I, I, I find it distracting to have a, a sidebar going up there in front of council. Mr. Manager, could we hold on one second, please? Could this, I just find it inappropriate that something's going up here. It seems like there's a deal, psych deal going on that nobody's privy to. So when we have code 10 St. Larry returns, we'll take a two-minute break. Right. Right. I think it's more that. appropriate. Right. Thank you. May Any I other just, questions? May I just conclude? Ten seconds, please. I, I just would like to say that the city of Concord and all of its employees should be held to the same caliber of behavior as the rest of society. Lying on purpose is not acceptable behavior, especially when it puts the livelihoods of so many people and families at risk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any more questions? And you quickly, I'm sorry, did you say where you, where you live currently? Live? Currently live. I live in Northwood. I do all of my grocery shopping in Concord, and I bank in Pittsfield. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next up, we have Laurel Leising. Leising? Street in Concord, and while I am not uh, strictly a free stater, these are my friends and these are my family. I have never felt more at home in New Hampshire, and I have never been helped more than I have been in New Hampshire. I have achieved more since I have moved here in the last three years than anywhere else, and I feel like that's because we take care of our own. We can defend ourselves. If this application were for, say, a pickup truck or a van in which we could transport the same number of people, I wouldn't have as much of a problem with it. But when there are gun portals in the side of this vehicle, that makes me feel a little bit unnerved. I lived in New Orleans for two years before living here, and I felt like my life was constantly in danger. Not because of my fellow citizens, but because the police force was massively corrupt, and I do not want to see that here. I work in an industry where I make people feel better about themselves. I'm an esthetician. I make them look better. I make them feel more confident. I do relaxing services for people. And if I am associated with an organization that is labeled as terrorist, then I am a terrorist. If giving someone a hand massage is terrorist activity, then I think we really need to take a look at our priorities. That's all. Thank you very much for your testimony. Any questions? Thank you very much, Ms. Lyson. My name is Christopher Booth, and I went to Concord High School here and lived in New Hampshire most of my life. I'm very concerned about the, the direction that the police force would take should they get a vehicle like this. And I think that it would set a good example if Concord said, no thanks, we'll help reduce the, the national deficit by not accepting this grant. I, I hope that that's the direction that that Concord would take. Should Concord get this vehicle, it's not going to be used appropriately. I can categorically tell you that. It's going to be brought out for parades to show to kids. They indicate that that's a good thing. That's not a good thing. If you look at how Manchester used their vehicle yesterday, they had a, a, a shooting and a suicide. Everybody was dead. And yet they show up with, with their vehicle and people pointing rifles at the building. This is a totally inappropriate police response. Concord's going to do the same thing. Concord's going to send this vehicle out to towns like Canterbury where I grew up. There is no crime in New Hampshire that, that, that deserves the militarization of the police department like that. Concord has about one murder every two years. It's, it's, 
it's a town that, that we roll up the sidewalks at 5 o'clock. This is just not an appropriate vehicle. And I hope that, that Concord does do, do the right thing and say no thanks. Thank you, Mr. Booth. Uh, there's a question. Mr. Booth, nice to see you again. Um, you mentioned that if the police department and the compact require this vehicle, that it would be not used appropriately. Did you feel that they use the peacekeeper of this vehicle as you're placing, that they use that in an inappropriate manner as well? I have no knowledge about how the peacekeeper has ever been used, but I can categorically say that that the Bearcat would not be used appropriately. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, the, 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 the police talk about responding to barricade hostages situations. Well, I am certain that people have been barricading them and taking hostages for a thousand years. And people have, in society, have been able to respond to that type of situation long before these tank-like vehicles were invented. Technology does not solve crime. When you look at the causes of crime, and what's a crime anyway? A crime is somebody breaking the law. Well, the only thing that makes it a crime is because you passed a law against it anyway. I mean, 2,000 years ago, there were 10 ways that you could be put to death. Eight of those today are not even crimes. So that's a no. <laughs> that that's a no. Good question. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Uh, Ryan Blackman. Brian Blackman. I only have one minute and a half, I guess, so I really can't get into everything I wanted to get into. Um, part of my problems with some of the lies in the application, I would... Uh, Actually, could you sit down first? Sure. And, uh, introduce yourself and state your name. My name is Brian Black, and I live in Ward 4, and I own a business here in Concord, and I have a problem with some of the lies in the application. I would direct your attention to number 33, fraud, and read that before you vote yes. Uh, some of these things are very pink in the application here, and I know I only have a limited amount of time. Some of them seem very self-serving. Um, the Department of Homeland Security requires all agencies to, com to comply with MIMS for a tactical team to be in compliance with NIMS and qualify as a Type 2 team. So basically, the Concord Area SWAT team wants to be a Homeland Security Type 2 SWAT team. That's self-serving. That's not people serving. Uh, you know, uh, Chief also said it took three hours to get the response to uh, his uh, other situation, I believe they called Belknap County. I talked to uh, the captain over at the uh, SWAT team of the state police the other day, and he was a little shocked. He said, wow, we have a Lenko. We could have been there in a whole lot shorter than three hours. And they said that the state police are available for every community in the state. Well, if we have a Lenko up on Hazen Drive, why do we need a new one? for the city of Concord because it's the newest model. And it's the newest model that, according to letter K, um, will be the only one in the region and readily available for mutual aid requests and assistance. And I'm assuming that's outside of 20 towns that the state police could already handle from Hazen Drive. And the chief has also said he needs protection from 50 caliber rounds. In case any of you don't know what a 50 caliber round is, I'd like to show you. It's called an anti-aircraft round. And it's this big one right over here. Okay, that takes down planes and, and big armored vehicles and stuff like that. It's a military round, a 50 caliber round. And I just want to let you know that Cal Drager used this little tiny one right here. Okay, this is a 223. Cal Drager used this. The chief wants protection from that big one down on the end. Okay. The average time for the Bearcat to respond to a unit, even if it's in Kong, it's 15 to 20 minutes. That's not going to save the life of any officer responding, responding to a scene because the average bulletproof vest will do this to a rifle round. It goes through them. So unless the department is going to spend $256,000 on type 4 level body armor for individual officers, I think it's a whole waste of money to get a Bearcat when you're thinking about protection of officers' lives because 
my little bad artwork down here. Again, the six, there's eight guys, little blue dots here. There's eight guys in a bear cat. They have to get out of that bear cat at some point to get the bad guy. They need body armor to do that. Or you can spend that kind of money and have 50 officers protected properly to go after the one bad guy. So if you're thinking about spending $258,000, I would rather protect 50 people than eight. Is that a, a standard issue? This is the standard That's, level. What is that, an insert that goes in between the black part of the vest? Yeah, this is just the insert that goes in there. That was actually mine when I worked for the state. Um, so what are you suggesting? Well, uh, uh, better armored vests? Well, if, if I were wanting to protect my officers and having them not be able to go up a driveway, because there's shooting going on and waiting for a vehicle for however long and having citizens be in danger, I would think the city or the police might want to look at having level four body armor in every cruiser in town. What, in, kind of, what do they have now? Uh, most officers wear level three A vests. That's generally what most of What's them the have. What's the cost of a level four vest? A level four vest, conservatively, about three to four thousand dollars. You can get a level four body armor. About the same price as the level three. Um, no, no, no. The level three is about eight hundred bucks. Level three A. The level three. There's a difference. There's three, three A, and level four. Level three A is actually less protective than the level three. The level three A is what most officers wear. Okay. Any other questions from the council? Thank you very much. Uh, next is Tim Bauman. Good evening. I'm uh, Tim Bauman. I live up on the Primrose Drive up in Pentecook, uh, and uh, Jennifer Credivick is my counselor, and uh, Steve Tripp, I believe, is my, my rep. Um, I think most everyone else has covered, you know, a lot of the issues in regards to the particular groups being pointed out, and it seems there may be a, a resolution to that. That does not, however, resolve some of the issues regarding the emphasis on community policing. Uh, the gentleman over there in the, the, the vest, I think, stated things very well, very rationally. Uh, the gentleman who also spoke, spoke earlier, um, who had been in Fallujah, you know, related the issues to you know, the difference between the military and, and community policing. I, that really, I think, is the main emphasis I want. I, I guess I didn't know how much I had grown to appreciate the character of Concord the six years that I've been here um, until I felt it was being threatened. And that threat seems to be coming from, from, this, from this approach um, to, to policing and, and not from what I see every day around me, which is a friendly uh, neighborhood. That's it. Thank you very much. Any questions, Laura? Thank you, Mr. Bell. Uh, Neil Connor. Oh, uh, Neil Connor. I had elected not to speak. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Leah Waltzko. Sorry for mispronouncing your last name. Leo Waltzko? Waltzko. Waltzko. Thank you. I'll try not to repeat. I'm Leah Waltzko. I live in Manchester. I do pay federal taxes, though, so I feel I have something to add to this discussion. I'd like to talk about numbers for a second that haven't been discussed before. I the $17 trillion we spoke of and um, other things like that. Um, I understand that the police officers run toward danger, and that is a that's an admirable thing. That's what heroes do. But we need to put things into perspective when we govern, and like the prayer that you started your meeting with today, you have to weigh everything and use justice as your measuring stick. The Department of the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports every year the 10 most dangerous jobs in America. Police force members are not on that list. Taxi drivers are, roofers are, uh, who else do we have? Farmers, garbage collectors are more likely to be seriously injured or killed in the line of their duty. So I understand the police officers want the most up-to-date equipment that they can get. That makes sense from their perspective. But your perspective is one of justice. And that same money that will be used and can't be spent again could buy 
Instead, 182 New Hampshire residents food stamps for a year. It could buy one year's Section 8 housing for 60 average recipient families in this state. It could buy one year's disability payments for eight 100% injured veterans that have come home from serving us overseas. It could buy 32 single parent, two child families TANF assistance for a full year. These two are real threats. Hunger is a real threat. You can die from that as well. I ask you to weigh with justice and rationality and not be driven by blind fear. One last little set of statistics for us to put some things in perspective. I don't know if I have my, I, I heard Chris Booth say that every couple of years someone dies in Concord. I did some investigation and all I could find was in 2011 there was a single murder and you had to go back to 2004 before that. Two people since 2004 have been murdered in the city. You are, and this is from the federal government as well, National Safety Council, your chance of dying from a hornet stinging you is 1 in 71,000. Your chances of dying by being struck by lightning are 1 in 126,000. And your chances of dying from a terrorist attack are 1 in 20 million. So we need to put the brakes on the fear. And we need to act rationally. Terrorism works because it makes people irrational and it makes them destroy themselves. That's what's happening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you alluded to the things that could, the, the money could be better spent on, but do you believe that that actual federal money would ever be spent on anything except for uh, safety? Yes, I do. I think you have a chance in this room right now for a small victory of rational thought and that it could encourage other small town councils in this state and across this country to do the same thing. I've spent some time in Concord testifying in front of state lawmakers and what I hear them is they tell me, go talk to this, don't talk to your people that go to DC. I come here, I'm told, go talk to them. There never seems to be any place to go to put the brakes on everybody running our country. You want to know what the real danger is? Cast your glance over to Detroit. Take a look at what's happening in countries that are going bankrupt over in Europe. We, we have real danger coming. Yes, I do think that it's possible that if we made the right decision here, and I implore you to do that, and I don't mean to now make anybody angry, and I'm not a member of the Free State Project, but if I lied on a government form, I wouldn't be able to fix it with a little side deal. I would be held accountable. I want that form withdrawn at the Department of Homeland Security. I don't want something else done. I don't want the Department of Homeland Security to have it a file somewhere because I don't feel safe that those people that have come here and that have lived here all their lives are seen as a terrorist threat. I am afraid of my federal government. And some of the recent revelations, I think, show that we have reason to be. This isn't all tinfoil hat. And I, I don't know if this council can be held legally to, to blame if you sign off on a fraudulent form. But if you can, and you do, I hope they sue you. <laughs> yeah. Where they sue this city for as much as they can get. I honestly do. And that will cost this city real money out of this city's pocket. Thank you. You want to finish. Uh, Kevin Bloom. <laughs> Mr. Mayor Proton, members of the council, thanks for hearing me. I'll make this very brief. I think everybody's pretty much covered all the, the objections, but um, uh, my name is Kevin Bloom, I'm a concrete resident, and I wanted to see if Chief Duval knew my name, because apparently, I, unbeknownst to me, I was assigned with one day of 
causing a daily challenge. Um, I believe there are only only around seven free staters who live in Concord. I think most of them are in this room. So <laughs> I was just curious if they knew our names and they could have just taken us to lunch or they could have offered us thirty thousand dollars and we'd stop terrorizing people. <laughs> <laughs> so when went all wrong. And I did get a parking ticket four months ago, but it was dismissed. So I think we're clean and uh, I don't think we're a threat to the city of Concord. Possibly to the beer supply, but <laughs> do I have any questions? That's all. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Are there any questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. I have one minute. I love it. Uh, Alva Miradal. Okay. I'm sorry, you're going to have to. <coughs> That's fine. Could you, uh, are you able to move the microphone up higher so we can hear you? Right. You can introduce yourself, please. Uh, my name is Alba McDowell, and I am the designated mother of the Occupy New Hampshire. And I am offended that we are called a terrorist. Well, not really, but. Well, ladies and gentlemen of Concord City Council, the members of the press, the members, the fellow citizens of New Hampshire, good, good evening to all of you. I stand before all of you tonight with my earnest intent to speak in behalf of those of my fellow citizens concerned of those outcome both today and the future of the next seven generations to come. I am here to remind you that whatever decision you make tonight is going to linger on for the next seven generations ahead of me and you. When this issue surfaced on my Facebook page, it sent shivers on my spine. The memories of the Shanaman Square massacre engulfed my mind. There it is, an exemplified example of what can happen when we fail to look beyond the now. Those students are protesters whose bodies are blown into little tiny pieces of flesh where children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the same men and women who made the acquisition of the Humvees we don't have the bear cut back then, we have the home base, have made. Whatever you decide, it is going to come and it's going to be used against you when your position as a ruling class is over. They could be bribing you today when your voice is alive and meaningful, but time is coming that you will become one of us. Like us, the tyrant is going to silence you and voices of the seventh generations ahead of you. The mere picture of an armored vehicle makes the amend First Amendment right mute. Its impact on many meaningful dialogue impossible. Imagine you next to another man at point range with 45 caliber in his hand asking you, do you love me? You have no you have no option e even to remain silent. That is the closest scenario that I can tell you that can happen to all of us. It doesn't erode our unalienable rights. Rather, it reduces our very existence to nothing, next to nothing. Reduces the value of humanity, both the assailant and the assaulted, in a category below the working machine. I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up, please. Turn our joy to grief and sorrow and our happiness to an endless fear of security, uh, endless fear, an endless fear of security. What kind of existence is that? Thank you very much. Would you like to submit that in, uh, as part of the record? <clears throat> Thank you very much. And if I may I'd add one thing that the uh, uh, chief didn't uh, mention, <coughs> in Wikipedia, the bear cut is and in my uh, I have a pretty intimate uh, uh, relationship with Humvees that those armored vehicles can be more than
modifiable. They can shoot cannons, they can shoot the... Uh, 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 they didn't use tear gas on a canister, they used those hand bees with ca uh, cannons of tear gas. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, is there anybody else wishing to testify that was not able to sign up on a damn card? Okay, let's see, I see a lot of There were a few people here first. So, you sir, right in the front row? I can get that. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> My name is Michael Lorry. I am a resident of Enfield, the town of Compact. Uh, I'm a third generation Grant Stater. My mother graduated from Concord High School. I'm also a mil U.S. military veteran. I served in the U.S. Air Force. Uh, if you had told me 20 years ago when I was serving my country and, and defending it against the uh, Soviet Union that someday we would have armed personnel care carriers used to roam the streets of Concord, New Hampshire, I would have told you you're a raving lunatic. Because that sort of thing doesn't happen here in America where people are free and we have a government that is a government of by and for the people. So the idea that we should have that just because it's free money, it's not free money, it's all of our money. And it's more than just all of our money, it's debt. You know, and debt is a form of slavery. The more this country goes into debt, the heavier the chains on all of us. And you need to think about that. It's not something you can just toss off and say, you know, it's not my responsibility. It's everybody's responsibility. And as previous speakers have said, you know, the Marine Colonel talked about it being a, an army in place that's being built, standing army that's being used, that's being put together. And he's absolutely correct. You're just thinking about, well, what can one armored vehicle do, really? So the fact is, is the <coughs> Department of Homeland Security has already deployed over 2,700 of these armored vehicles across the country. And you wonder, you know, how much of a force that is. The U.S. and all of NATO, at the height of the Cold War, had less armored vehicles in Europe to face off against the Soviet Union then Homeland Security is deploying across our country against our own citizens. And you need to stand up as American citizens and put your foot down and say, that stops here. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm green I'm oh, sorry, Mr. Lawyer, I'll say. Oh. My name is Monica McEachin, and I've lived in Concord for several years. Um, before that, I've lived in Nashua, New Hampshire. I've lived in Massachusetts. Um, I can tell you right now that I have not felt safe with the police as it is now. You don't have to actually go out and protest. All you have to do is be not normal or what most people consider not normal. Having a mental illness, the police do not understand how to communicate well. I've had, lived in the projects in Massachusetts and have the police hung up on me. I've had my child taken away from me in Nashua, New Hampshire, and the police chose to do the blame the victim game. And my boyfriend in 2011, my boyfriend called the police on me. He's a registered sex offender has to register every year with them. They should know who he is. Yet, three, three, a squad of three large men stepped through my living room without identification whatsoever and was questioning me. And when I asked if I could get dressed, one of them said to me, are we going to have a problem here? I felt terrorized in my own home. And this was in 2011. I can count on one hand all the good experiences I've ever had with any police officer. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Haas, you're next. Chairman? See, I haven't seen you in a while. We missed you earlier with the Executive Council. That's your testimony. 
Uh, speaking of uh, executive council, I have given the governor and the executive council information on federal funding. I presume this is federal funds, right? It is, Mr. Haas. Could you actually identify yourself for the record? Yeah, Joe Haas. I work in Concord. I live in Gilmanton. Thank you. And uh, there's a report that is supposed to be coming out of the Attorney General's office any time now because he is investigating, Joe Foster, the, the new Attorney General, is investigating my complaint against all federal funds going to all these department heads. And I've notified these department heads by email and by phone and uh, by just stating this at the Executive Council that the vote in Congress for all these funds is unlawful. It's unlawful because Section 2 of the 14th Amendment where says that when there's a state that does not elect their judges, which New Hampshire we don't elect our judicial officers, the re representation in Congress shall be reduced. And the governor, by her Article 51 duty, is refusing to do that. And I've tried the citizen's arrest against her. I've tried an RSA. I offered her a citizen of the U.S. She didn't want to do it. So I did a 594 colon 14, which is a summons in lieu of an arrest. And I tried to get one of the state troopers, Scott Fry, to serve her. He refused. He gives it over to the AG for an investigation. So my request to all of you is to please have your counsel, I, I presume it's Jim Kennedy now, rather than Paul Kavanaugh, right? That'd be correct. Yeah. Would he please uh, contact the new attorney general and ask him for the report, not the investigation, but to force the report out of him that shows that New Hampshire is one of 11 states that we do not elect our judicial officers. And this goes back to when Judd Gregg was a federal rep. I asked him when he was over at the Highway Hotel. This thing's been going on for years and decades. So, Mr. Haas, what does that have to do with the line cut? The uh, bear cap? Are you suggesting that we should only have one congressman? Yes. And but how does that tie into the bear cap? Because the vote for this money is unlawful. The end does not justify the means. For you to accept this and to agree that that vote was lawful is, is unlawful on your part, and you'd be liable as like uh, receiving stolen property. Stolen funds. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Is Jim Kennedy here today? He happens to be here. Oh, I'd appreciate you giving him an order to do it. Because he might just sit on it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moss. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good to see you. Okay. All right. Who is next that didn't get the sign up? Your hand went up while uh, Mr. Moss was testifying. <laughs> Good evening. Hi. My name is Carrie De Phillips, and I am. I live in Lincoln, New Hampshire, which is one of the cities that um, the police chief, chief listed as being serviced by the potential bear cats. I also have a letter from Devin Chafee, who was unable to make it here today. Okay. She's the head of the NHLU. Are you from this? Are you from the no. no, no, I just happen to have that letter. Okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about public perception. I'm a business owner. I own a PR firm. Um, I am responsible for some of the national news coverage of this Bearcat event, and I suspect some of the future coverage of uh, um, this Bearcat hearing. <laughs> uh, have any of you seen the Lenko Bearcat <coughs> promotional video? Yes. yes. Um, a lot has been said about how this is a rescue vehicle. The, na the word rescue is nowhere in the Bearcat acronym. The R stands for um, recovery. Response. <laughs> recovery and attack. Response. response. Sorry. Response. Uh, response. And attack is definitely in there. And if you look at the uh, Bearcat video, which has now been taken off of the internet, uh, there are still some tour files that you can access if you really want to hunt it down. If you're interested, um, I'm sure we can get it up for you. And I'd be happy to send y'all a copy of it. Um, it doesn't show that bear cat being used to rescue anyone. It shows it being used as an attack vehicle. And I think that that's something that we all really need to consider. What is this going to be used for in a city that's had two homicides in 10 years? Um, I think it's unnecessary. I think it's a waste of tax dollars. And I think that a lot of you know that too. Uh, it's easy to take free money when it's on the table. And I encourage you all to do the right thing and say no. It, and stand up for yourself and for your community. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, way in the back of the orange shirt and glasses. <coughs> Good evening. 
Evening, welcome. Evening. Uh, Jesse Mertz, resident of Pembroke. Oh, I called you a lot earlier. Yeah, I tried to get out. You could have been here, you could have here an hour. It's cool. I was going to say that again. <laughs> um, actually, sort of touching on what the previous speaker just mentioned, um, I think it all comes back down to marketing and public perception. If none of you have seen the Bearcat video that was on the front page of Lenco or whatever the Massachusetts company that manufactures the Bearcat, if you haven't seen that video, I highly suggest that you do find a way to watch it before you make your decision here this evening. As it is a slow, somber piano concerto set to the Boston bombings and the subsequent martial law that ensued with police pointing AR-15s at residents in their home from a bear cat. 15, 10, 10, 15 minutes of this. It's repugnant. It's absolutely disgusting that they're capitalizing on a tragedy to sell communities weapons that they don't need. And I think that just speaks volumes to how the military industrial complex has infiltrated every part of our society to the point that it's now happening in our hometowns and we are seeing stuff occur that people said would never happen in this country. It could never happen here. And I would just like to echo or restate, shall I say, there, there, were, there was a lot of other people that said it can't happen here too. And we fought a war for that. Thank, Thank you. Mr. Martin, appreciate it. Any questions? I highly encourage you to watch that video and anyone else that hasn't seen it. Thank you. The gentleman in the flag blue shirt. Got to be fast. Whoever holds your hand up real quick. You did it. No, I got you this. <laughs> the next time. I just want to say that. Oh, sir, could you introduce yourself? Oh, my name is Shane. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a little choking up. My name is Shane Fletcher, and I live in Concord, New Hampshire. And I just want to say that this is a lot of money spent on something that could be spent on stuff that is more positive. We're spending all this money on fighting problems and stuff like that. It's like the catfish in the fish tank that only feeds off the problems. Why not we just get above that and be able to do things like put more money in schools, put more money in education. Um, and another thing is that a lot of these people um, who are here know what this, um, this bear cat is. And you all say it's a rescue um, equipment. Well, are you going to say that um, five years from now? When, or a couple of years from now when you're reelected? Um, because we all have um, it on record that you're saying that. And when things go awry and police end up having too much power on their hands, we're going to remember this night. And it's, and it's going to reflect in our voting um, next, next election cycle, which would be next year or whatever. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, sir, with a black t-shirt. Welcome. If you can introduce yourself, yeah. My name is Marco Martino. I am from Epsom, and I work in Concord. And I think one of the big concerns I have with the Bearcat is the misuse of it. And I witnessed uh, misuse of force by state and local police firsthand. There was a missing persons report filed a couple of years ago, and the actual circumstances of it was a girl had lied to her mom about where she was going, and instead of going to her friend's house, she met up with her friend and came to Chichester. Her mom found out where she was, called the police, and reported that her daughter had gone missing and was believed to be found at this address. The police came in force, state and local, about five cruisers, I believe eight officers altogether. The girl came right out, they found her, there was no fight. They wanted to come into the house illegally and they would not let them in. The girl who owned the house was being very vocal. She was about five foot two, maybe a hundred pounds soaking wet, and eight police officers tased her four times 
in order to enter the house. They arrested everybody that was in the house and did not charge anybody with any crime and there were no convictions. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am, right over there with the uh, glasses and the chair. Over again. My name is Tara Powell. I'm from Canterbury. I've lived here my entire life. We're a sleepy community here in New Hampshire. If we fought really hard to repeal Stand Your Ground, I'm not sure where the logic to want tanks is. That's my one question. If you want to repeal Stand Your Ground for the lack of violent crime that is posed by a law that you can stand your ground as a citizen, why do cops get tanks? That's my one question. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Emily Spencer. I'm a Concord High School student and I live on Kent Street in Concord. Um, I'm here today to address um, um, how the bear cat reflects the community because I really respect Concord as a community and how the people can come together um, and feel safe. And reflecting on what I heard earlier, I want to reiterate that the bear cat shows a militarization of the police. And I don't think that reflects Concord's values. And I really hope um, that you, as the representatives of Concord, listen to us and hear what we have to say that this isn't what Concord needs. Thank you. Thank you for showing up today. I appreciate it. You're, you know, you're the third high school student we've had tonight, which is unusual. So it's very good, very hard to see young people coming out in school. So thank you. Sarah, please go. No clapping one way or the other. Good evening, sir. Please stay in the My name is James Cookley. I moved here for Free State Project two years ago. Um, before that, I came from the Orlando area, so it just shows my commitment towards a freedom, peaceful community uh, I want to be a part of. And uh, tonight, I'm speaking basically in uh, the matter of perspective or perception that people see out of this whole hearing. Um, this is not anything new that I haven't seen in other places, city councils, county commission meetings, and that. Um, but basically, like the other gentleman back there, I had served in the military at least 20 years ago against uh, what we know now as the former Soviet Union. And I watched a lot of things change in uh, that time. And one of it being that a lot of people no longer look at city councils and that as addressing their issues anymore because it seems like people come here or any city council meeting and they speak and then you're like, yeah, yeah, but your mind's pretty much already made up. And the other factor is, is that there's this perception that you use in your application to sit there and label groups like Occupy or the Free State Project, which are peaceful movements, as terrorists. Well, I can tell you this right now, since September 11th, I've already had that label. I'm a ex-military veteran, so I'm automatically labeled a terrorist, according to your government. And I just think it's sad that you're gonna sit here and support, despite all these people from many different backgrounds, um, to try and approve through an armored vehicle that nobody wants. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. So we got away in the back there. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you very much. I was not planning to speak. Um, so this will be very quick. I'm Tanya Rochette. I live in Concord. I've been here for about 10 years. And I came here with every intention to listen, to learn, and to you know hear the concerns from all sides. And what I've learned tonight is no one is listening to one another. Um, unfortunately, there's been a blatant disregard for ground rules set by the city council with respect for time and hearing and cheering. While I appreciate a lot of the passion that's gone into the thoughts, I am a, a bit concerned with the, the lack of openness and willingness to listen to others. 
Um, I've seen an incredible presence from the local police uh, in the last few years, especially presence in National Night Out, an increased presence and willingness to become part of the public persona and integrate with the community and, and really have been impressed with their outreach efforts and become a more friendly presence. And as a parent of an elementary school and a middle school student, I'm not okay with the four hour response time that our police and fire might need when seeking to protect my kids and my neighbors. So I, I do ask that you consider accepting this grant and these funds that are made available to protect our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sarah Boucher, you're next up. Good evening. Uh, my name is William Hoster, and I live in Manchester, New Hampshire. I just wanted to speak briefly to the path, um, the method by which the Bearcat would be coming uh, to Concord. Um, the company that makes these, Lenco, uh, their business model is unsustainable. It's at uh, well, it's corporate welfare, plain and simple. They build a product that uh, would not survive in a free market, a product that <coughs> nobody really wants or would purchase directly. So their model involves going to Washington, D.C. and convincing the feds uh, to take money from all of these people and give it to the Department of Homeland Security, who then takes it and gives it to Lenco, and they call it a grant and pretend that they're doing us a favor. But again, they're just taking money out of our community and giving it yeah. to a company that builds a product that is unneeded and unwanted. And again, we know that because if it really was needed and wanted, then communities individually would be coming forward to purchase these. And they're not. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sir. <coughs> You want to testify? You're next. Hello, my name is Christian Panapacker. I moved here in August 2011 for the Free State Project. Here in Concord? Uh, it was Manchester and then in January 2012 that it was Concord. Everyone has made any point I can make. I can't say anything new, but it's important to me that you understand what the Free State Project is. What is your understanding of what it is? That's my question for you. You'll, you'll just have to continue to testify. We, we don't have a question and answer back and forth like that. All right, well, if you'd like to talk to me later, I'll be here. Okay. Thank We're you not a terrorist, much. and it's important to all of us, I believe. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sir. Thank you very much. Sure. I was born in Burbank, California. I moved to Maui, Hawaii in 1957. I moved to Concord, New Hampshire in 2005. My name is Charles Davidson. Thank you. Uh, I love Main Street. I think Concord is probably one of the most vibrant you know, capital cities in the United States, and I've seen many. I've talked to many of your police officers as I'm just walking down, going to co-op, you know, walking down the street. I've never seen any problems here. Not one. I, I, I know about the friendly kitchen, you know, and the issues of homelessness across the you know, street in Merrimack. So it, it fathoms me to figure out why the Congress Police Department would need such a thing. I mean, really, in all honesty. I mean, really. I have a missing daughter. January 10th next year is the 10th year that she's been missing. She's in May 16th. wasn't here for the before. So I know all about, you know, unfortunate situations where I might actually think of a Bearcat or a military vehicle that might be, you know, um, you know, in use. In, in my circumstances, it would have been. You know, I won't share the details because we don't have the time. But in Concord, one of the beautifulest cities in the United States, it doesn't need this symbolically it's not good. So please reject this. There's other ways. Let's get back to the beat cop. You know, instead of just walking around, getting to know everybody, you know, all your merchants here, 
you know, knowing and if there's any problems, if there's anything really, you know, concerning, you know, the people to let the Concord police know what's up. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Sarah, right over here. Yeah. And then Sarah in the black shirt, you'll be next. Okay. Hello, I'm Charles Patterson. Um, I'm King. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I stand here in total opposition to this council accepting a uh, quarter of a million dollar grant to get a Bearcat or Ballistic Engineered Armored Response Counter Attack Truck. You position yourselves on the defensive. You claim that you are doing this to protect the people, but I'm going to claim that what you're saying is a lie. This isn't to protect the general people. The Bearcat is to protect your income, and your income is based on theft from people, and this Bearcat will be used against the people for government's gain. I'm confident that if you took a general poll of the people of Concord and the outlying areas where the Bearcat is speculated to be used, you'll find a majority of the people in opposition to moving in a tank to monitor them and their families. If you truly cared about democracy, why don't you take a referendum of the city and allow them to vote on the Bearcat issue? If you did this, you'd find a majority against the acceptance of a Bearcat. Now, the city of Concord, New Hampshire, a city that's supposed to be about the spirit of freedom, is labeling freedom-oriented individuals as domestic terrorists. I say it is not those that want less government in this country that represent a threat. It is the people that want more government in this country that, rest, that uh, represent a domestic threat. The individuals in this council ought to apologize for having the gall, the audacity, to label terrorists the ones that actually live by the motto, live free or die. On top of that, you pretend as if the Bearcat is free. It's not you that has to pay for it, but I will, and the generations following will, and by actions like these, you stab the people basically in the back. I mean, think of your children. Do you want them born into a police state you're creating? Do you want them less prosperous and forced to pay the debt for your spending? If you allow this armored tank to the city of Concord and into the state of New Hampshire, you don't have to wonder what's happened to the world anymore. You can look in the mirror because the guilt will fall on you. If you want to enslave younger generations, just one, one more sentence, please. Okay. Uh, even further into debt, get the Bearcat. If you want to militarize the police to use against the people, go ahead, get the Bearcat. If you want to have courage, if you want to stand up to the police state, if you want to live on in the tradition of what New Hampshire represents, you will not allow an armored tank to patrol the city of Concord. Thanks, but no tanks. Thank you very much. Sit right way in the back. Question. I'm sorry. I just wanted a clarification. Is there a key? I'm sorry, there was a question and I, I, oh, I missed it. I think yes. you said you were from Keene? Yes. Thank you. Oh, that was it. Was oh. Sorry. <laughs> I, you sorry. said it so no, no. quick I didn't hear it. Thank oh, yeah. You. You look a lot like Brian Paul from back of the room, but when I get closer, you have better hair. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's rare when you get closer. <laughs> I wasn't planning on speaking. Thanks for listening. Could you introduce Paul. yourself? My name is Keith. I live uh, west of Manchester. Keith, uh, what's your last name? My last name is Ammon. So, and the only reason I'm here is because I'm a free stater. I moved here about four years ago from Pennsylvania, and it's because Free staters were named on the application. That's the reason I think most of us are here. So I was glad about an hour ago when you guys were able to parse out the different issues that we're, that we're dealing with. One is a false application. The other one is a little more esoteric, and that is the, militar the militarization of the police. Um, it seems esoteric, right? When I was a little kid, I grew up near Valley Forge Park. I had a green Schwinn with a yellow banana seed. And I rode through the park all the time and saw the, the plaques of the different battles that were fought. And I would imagine, you know, I'd recreate it in my 13-year-old mind. So I think this had a lot of influence on, there's a lot of history here too as well, you know, back in the, uh, the Revolutionary War. And the militarization of the police is an issue because we might have to fight that battle again one day. If you look at how many rounds of ammunition the Department of Homeland Security is purchasing, you can see videos on YouTube of trucks just like the Len Lenko Bearcat. You can see trains carrying armored personnel carriers and tanks. 
that go on for miles. And no one knows exactly what they're for, but you can, you can see the video, it's not, it's not made up. The, the, the federal government is arming up the local police forces. And this, this is, it's slow, it's methodical, it's incremental. If you blink or if you don't really think about it, you're gonna miss it. But this is what's happening. So that's the other issue that, that we're trying to highlight. There's a book that I haven't read yet, but I'm familiar with the author. It's uh, The Rise of the Warrior Cop by Radley Balco. And I suggest that you get a copy and read it. He's a writer, he's written a lot about police abuse. Um, and there's plenty of videos online. You can see police punching people, tasing people, shooting people, shooting people's dogs. There's thousands of videos. We don't want that to happen here. That's what we're saying. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Okay, is there anybody else? Yes, sir. My name is Jason Rokich. I'm a resident of Manchester, and I have money taken from me from the uh, by the organization that is talking about distributing these funds. Um, which leads me to my first point: um, the use of the term "federal funds" is disingenuous. It's not federal funds; it's the funds of nearly everybody in this room. Um, the second thing is we keep dropping the term "community policing." Um, when we talk about community policing, I think about the relationships that I've had over the years with various law enforcement officers that, unlike many people in this room, have been largely positive. I find that many of them believe wholeheartedly in what they're doing and providing a service to the community. However, when we talk about bringing in what is effectively a tank, we are militarizing the police force. We are changing the image and definition of what they do. Um, and, and it's not possible to maintain the same community policing, the same attitude when we have militarized what they do. And I have one more point, um, which is simply that I'm not as, a, I don't object as strongly to simply being labeled a terrorist, but simply the fact that the terms Occupy New Hampshire and Free State Project were even thought of to be mentioned in the application. It's not an indication of just wanting to get the just wanting to get the grant. It's an indication of what the actual intent is and what thoughts come to mind. If we just needed to name organizations to get the grant, we could have named the AARP, AAA, any credit union, but we didn't. What was mentioned were political organizations, and it is clear that the intent of this is simply to squash any freedom of speech. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else wishing to testify? Yes, sir. Oh, right in the back. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Alex Reed. I'm a biochemist at the University of New Hampshire, and I would like to implore the committee to investigate the larger forces at play that are happening in this country surreptitiously. There are things bigger than all of us that are transpiring. And there, there's a lot of research that can be done to, that can maybe inform you about what's going on and it's very concerning. And if you knew what most of us know, you would also be very concerned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. Sir, we have a question for you, Councilman. I, I couldn't help you. Said if we knew what you know, what do you know that I don't know? <laughs> Where's the pile? Okay. So, thanks, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are large financial, economic problems in this country, and they are massive and potentially global, and. By this may seem like an insignificant decision to get this bear cat, but you will be on the wrong side of history. And history, history will not look favorably upon this decision because it will be just a small step in the wrong direction. And people will always ask, 
well, how did we get here? How did we get to this point where we're not able to speak, where our currency has been destroyed, and the police are knocking down people's doors? People will wonder, how did this ever happen? It could be your children. And it's these small incremental steps that, call it that, um, that get us to that point. And like the woman earlier said, it could be you. There's no, there's no, there's, you're not special. We're all just human beings. And when you're not in this position that you are in now, or perhaps your children, the, the, the federal government will be indifferent. There are larger forces at play that affect all of us. And, you know, you guys are just a cog in the system. You guys are just another gear that's turning and helping this perpetuate. It's small incremental steps, and I would just hope that you see the larger picture of what's going on in this country and around the world. <coughs> Did I answer your question? Not at all. But thank you for your testimony. I'm sorry that I couldn't answer your question. I, I still don't know what you mean, but I appreciate your testimony. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's somebody else who wanted to testify somewhere back there. Sir? Back Hi, my name is Ian Underwood, uh, to within 1%, I'm from Concord. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, I've never met you before, but I think you were doing an awesome job moderating this. This is a very uh, contentious situation, and uh, in case nobody else says it, I think you've done an amazing job for the time I've been in the room. Um, so, Mr. Kostrick earlier talked about the business model of the company who makes these money's gone, it's been taken in federal taxes. The problem is we'd like to get it back and we can't just go to them and say we'd like to buy meals for poor people or uh, send money to schools and do a lot of other things that a lot of other people have mentioned. So the question might be how can we get it back in another form and I apologize that this is, I didn't get into here until uh, relatively late, I apologize if this suggestion has been made or if the contract would forbid it, but it occurs to me one of the things that might make a lot of people happy would be if you amended the uh, application, got the grant, got the Bearcat, sold it, and used the money from the Bearcat. <laughs> I know, I know. It's, it's all the politics in Concord. And I, I, I love the city, and I, I love the atmosphere and all of the, the diverse discussion that happens here. And I think it would be a shame if, um, if we took this action, especially because of the, the, the sort of the way that it was acquired with the, the intent and the application. Um, I know someone else asked you what you thought a free stater was, and I understand you can't answer. So... Let me just real try to quickly sum it up. It's made up largely of libertarians, and one of the tenets, the, the basic tenet is a non-aggression principle. We're peaceful by nature. We don't believe in the initiation of force. And I find it an irony that people who espouse this and discuss it and debate it um, using words are answered with uh, a vehicle capable of, of, of defending you know, armored positions. And uh, if if we can't trust the, the people who put in that application to understand the nature of the free state, which is very well documented and easy to talk to any of those members. Um, I don't think we'd want them in charge of a platoon that uses such force or uses uh, such defensive abilities. Um, and 
I'm sure there was other things I wanted to say, but I know there's lots of people who want to say it, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gideon. <laughs> Sir, way in the back. Uh, my name's John Belomo. I am a fellow grandstander. I currently live in London, Derry. Uh, a lot has been said tonight, going back and forth with a lot of things. I'd like to make this real quick. First of all, the gentleman who urged you to watch the promotional video is not something someone made up. This is a video that the company <coughs> itself made as a sales tool to present to people who are interested in purchasing this vehicle. Do look for that video and watch it. This is not a defensive vehicle. It is not marketed as a defensive vehicle. It's not meant to be a defensive vehicle. Second, a young lady pointed out earlier that in the city of Concord, it's been two murders in 10 years. Is, it that, that, is that true? I come from a city where that's every weekend. You do not need this vehicle, and that city doesn't have one. And I'd like to point out one last quick fact. Before I came here tonight, I wanted to do a little research on this myself and make up my own mind before I had anything to say about it. I did a quick Google search. So all I did was quote in, protests turned violent in New Hampshire. The first item that came up was the incident that Representative Lambert brought up earlier that happened back in June in front of the State House. The next item, and I had to go through over 120 different Google entries on that one search, the next item that brought up a violent protest in the state of New Hampshire was in 1765 in Portsmouth when the Stamp Act was passed, where a mock funeral of liberty was held. And that was the British saying it was a violent protest. It does not happen in this state. We have, every four years, the eyes of the entire nation is on this state. We all, you're all politicians, you see this state, we're all citizens, we see this every four years. This is going to be the most politically motivated state in the country. It does not happen here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Who's next? I would like to extend the comments of Alex Weed who discussed information that we know that you don't know. I believe when he referred to Sorry, sir. Oh, my name is Darren Tapp. I live in Chichester. Thank you very much. Could you say your last name again? Tapp, T-A-P-P. Thank you. Okay. So I, would, I just wanted to address Alex Weed's comments. He mentioned financial issues and uh, I'm a mathematician by trade. 16.75 is about the national debt. It's been about that way for seven, three months because that's the cap right now. As soon as the cap gets lifted, it's going to go up more as it has every time the cap's been lifted in the past recent years. Um, what happened in 2009 is the Federal Reserve started printing a whole bunch of money and buying treasury bonds with that money. This raised the monetary base from 0.8 trillion, less than 1 trillion, to, um, it's from 2009 to about today, and today it's around 2.9 trillion. So there's about been two trillion dollars that have been introduced into the economy to try to address issues like the housing level and things like that. Um, now, what else can I tell? Okay, so of that money that's been printed and anyway, that's created. However, it's created. It doesn't matter if it's printed or not. Um, it, a lot of it's gone to excess reserves that's uh, held by the uh, Federal Reserve. They started pay, paying interest on the excess reserves in 2009, so that has spiked up. It's over. It's around 1.9 trillion, and uh, the Fed reporting the St. Louis Federal Reserve stopped, stopped reporting this number recently. So I, I don't have anything more recent than maybe June. But this is an incredible amount of money. If this money ever gets circulating into the economy, we'll see a rapid rise of prices, and we'll see a lot of uh, panic by a lot of people who aren't. Um, aren't expecting this, and I believe that the reason why there are so many bear cats that are because of one reason that there are so many that are offered to us, as some people say for free, what we did cover now is not free, is because they 
they want to quell some civil unrest that's going to happen when all of this comes tumbling down. Thank you very much. That's a pretty good explanation there. Thank you. <laughs> any, uh, any questions? Thank you. Uh, anybody else wishing to testify? Uh, we're only going to go once. Sorry, Mr. Little. Uh, anybody wait, want to testify when you said up front? So, What's that? Yeah, this is what you said at the beginning. You're trying to get out of the second time you were down. Yeah, I know, I know. But uh, changing the rules. Sorry about that. We can't have everybody to testify twice. I said if there was time. Yeah. So if there was time, we'd go back. There's, there's obviously not time. We really devoted a lot of time to this. Yeah. And I doubt your position's going to change from now until. Unless your position's changed. <laughs> but I doubt it. No, sorry. That's all right. That was a rhetorical question. Anybody else wishing to testify? I've never seen this in the 12 years I started. Anybody else wishing to testify? Thank you very much. Darren, close. All right. Next item on the agenda. Madam Clerk, if you read, I have D, please. Ordinance.